Wow, it's, uh, it's really cool to get here and talk about philanthropy in the midst of all these people who actually do something. So what we like to say about Milago is that we are looking for the best solutions to the biggest problems in the poorest places. And my job, along with a couple superstars in San Francisco and a great board in New York, is to try to make sense of this and make bets on who's going to create the most change for the better. And I kind of stumbled into this. I was in medical school in San Francisco, and I acquired a wonderful mentor named Reiner Arnhold. And Reiner was a pediatrician who'd escaped from Nazi Germany. And he was a grizzled veteran of all of the humanitarian crises that swept the world in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. And he lived in a ramshackle A-frame in Sausalito, and he seemed to have only maybe three changes of clothing. Um, but he helped me start a project in Peru, and we became very good friends. And <clears throat> in 1993, we were working in Bolivia to, together, and Reiner died suddenly, actually while we were walking along a trail together. And in the aftermath of that, I came to know his, he had a very, he had a lovely family. And it turned out they'd been in banking for generations, and they were very good at it. And they wanted to start a foundation to carry on Reiner's legacy. And <clears throat> I didn't have a clue. So I hit the road, and over the last 15 years, I've gone all over the world looking at dozens of projects, trying to figure out <laughs> what works and how to know it when you see it. Um, and we've developed a set of tools that's worked very well for us in being better investors in change for the better. And what I'd say is that all of you are investors. You invest your time, your money, your increasingly in-demand attention span, your influence, trying to create change for the better. And so in the next 15 minutes and 25 seconds, I want to make you better at this than most of us who get paid for it. And the key is impact. We're obsessed with impact. <laughs> and to the point where a friend of mine gave me a t-shirt with this on it for Christmas. And <clears throat> how do you know when you've had impact? For us, it boils down to three things. Know your mission, know what you've set out to do, measure the right thing, measure it well. So we don't find the average mission statement very useful. <laughs> it doesn't tell us what we need to know. We wanted a mission statement in eight words that include a verb, a target population or setting, and an outcome that tells us something to measure. So I'm going to give you three examples from our Mulago portfolio that kind of help, us, help you see what, see what we mean. So the first is living goods. This is a cool project. This is a um, Avon Ladylike Network in Uganda where these dynamic saleswomen sell health products that people don't otherwise have access to door to door. And in doing so, they also are trained to teach moms some critically important home health practices that can save their kids. So, verb, target population, outcome. One Acre is a, a group in Kenya that works with farmers who are on subsistence farms where they don't even make enough food through the year to last. They have hungry months every year. And they work with them the, through the crop cycle, helping them with the training they need, the inputs they need, the credit they need, and access to markets. So that these people not only have enough to eat, but they have some, they are actually able to sell some of their crop for money. So, here we go. Verb, 
target outcome. All right. Um, another is island conservation. So 60% of the world's extinctions happen on islands, most of them due to invasive predators. And island conservation goes on to islands, eradicates the invasive predators, the species come back, the ecosystems recover. Verb, target, outcome. So you now know what your mission is. How do you know how to measure the right thing? And I need to keep things simple. So I ask people if you could only measure one thing to know if you fulfilled your mission, what would it be? It drives them absolutely nuts, but you actually often come up with something really doable. So for example, living goods, child mortality cuts right to the chase, and we know that for every kid who doesn't die, many more won't get sick. If you're trying to get people out of poverty, measure their income. And <clears throat> island conservation watches carefully to see when the, the populations of animals go back up to a point where they're safe. Um, now you've measured the right thing. What, what do we mean measure it well? Oh, forgot. What happens when you don't measure the right thing? So in microfinance, they measured activities, <clears throat> loans given out. They measured behavior, loans repaid. But for a long time, they assumed that if you repaid a loan, you must be getting richer. So nobody really measured impact or income. It turned out when people started taking rigorous looks at this that a, a little bit different picture emerged, which is that it looks like, and the, the, the jury isn't fully in, but it looks like 25% of people are well out of poverty, 50% are a little better off, maybe, but about the same, and 25% are actually worse off. And these are people who started out poor. That makes sense if you think about it. The average interest rate on microfinance approaches 40%. If you don't have something really productive to do with that, you can really get in the hole. So now back to how to measure well. Measuring well means taking an honest stab at understanding <clears throat> what change you created, what happened with you, and what would have happened without you. Because your real impact is the difference between the two. Now, sometimes you can get away with a simple before and after. On the left, goats. On the right, no goats. This is Guadalupe Island off the, um, off the Mexican coast. And they made this fence to just show what happens. On the left, scorched earth. On the right, grass seedlings, grass and seedlings, and the Guadalupe cypress, almost extinct, coming back. Now, one acre fund has to do just a little more complicated. So they measure before and after with their farmers. But maybe the increase in income was due to a rainy season, you know, more rain, or maybe it was due to higher commodity prices. You don't really know. So they need to compare to someone who isn't a one acre farmer. They need to compare group to group. Now, for living goods, it's a little more complicated still, because there's so many factors that play a role in child mortality. So what they are doing is they're getting a baseline in a whole set of communities, and then they randomly select half of them to get a living goods promoter and half not, so that they can know, does a living goods promoter in your village really make a difference or not? So we've, we've talked about in, impact, and I hope that in the upcoming holiday giving season, you find the eight-word mission statement useful. And, <clears throat> but this is pop tech. And so I want to talk for a little bit about impact from a thing. So at Mulaga, we often have people coming to us with a thing that's going to save the world. It's a product or a technology, a new tool. And we want to know. Well, is it? 
And so we have four questions that we like to ask that really help us sort it out, and that with a little legwork and some common sense, just about anybody can use. And those are, is it needed? Is it really needed? Does the thing work like it's supposed to? Will it get to those who need it, and a lot of them? And will they use it right when they get it? So I'm going to talk about some failures, as requested. And I've chosen them for specific reasons, five in fact. One is they got a lot of the limelight and changed people's views on what was useful. Two, they burned through a ton of money. Three, they inflicted some cost on those who were already on the margin. Four, they went on for a long time, often ignoring signs or not gathering information that could have warned them. And five, a lot of people smarter and a lot more experienced than me told them they were <clears throat> blowing it from the beginning. So, the life straw. So, this was touted as a solution to the one billion people in the world who don't have clean water. It's uh, essentially a, a big ass straw with a filter in it. And it lasts for about a year, and then you have to buy a new one. And it was intended that you would hang it around your neck so that you'd have it handy if a, a, a nearby irrigation ditch beckoned. So let's do our four questions. Real need? Well, of course, everybody needs water. Does it work? Well, yes and no. It's a very good filter. It filters out 99.99% of all the pathogens that are major causes of diarrhea. But it only filters about 100 cc's a minute. So 300 cc's. Six seconds. I checked last night, actually, and <clears throat> <laughs> don't check it three times before you go to bed. <laughs> anyway, if this, if I was drinking this from a life straw, I'd have two minutes to go. And in fact, your two liters a day, that's the minimum you really need, especially in hot climates, that's 20 minutes a day. So did it get to the people who need it? The wholesale cost is about five bucks. Anybody who knows retail will tell you that the retail price is probably gonna be about 15. If you make two bucks a day, that's seven days work. If you're here making 20 bucks an hour, that means in seven days, that's over a thousand bucks. Would you pay a thousand bucks for this thing? Especially when you have to buy another one next year? And as for using it right, look at the picture. Nobody wanted to do this. And the one study I could find that really looked at community use, only 13% of people even claimed they used this, much less, and you can assume that means a lot less actually did it. So, Don't pay attention to awards in the media. There's no correlation at all with impact. Here's what Forbes magazine said about the life straw. Oh, come on. <laughs> um, so, life straw, let's beat up on um, one laptop per child. <laughs> so, a computer that was supposed to be handed out to poor kids in the world to make them something. It, uh, it works really well as a computer. It's, it's fast. It's, um, it's indestructible. It's green. And <clears throat> I could never figure out what this thing was for. You know, where, where we work, there's not a digital divide. There's a pencil divide. Schools are falling down. Teachers don't show up. Um, this thing didn't come in at its price point. It ended up costing, when all is said and done, about 400 bucks to get this in front of a kid. 
you're a $2 a day family and you're gonna let your kid take the most expensive thing in the whole household to school? This was nuts. And so there really, I, I don't think there was really a need for this thing. So the other three questions don't really matter. So who cares? We're done. <laughs> so last, play pumps. Deep hole, deep borehole down in an aquifer. Joyful kids push a merry-go-round. Pump water up into a, a tower and everybody in the community has water. It's, it's so seductive and it's um, so wrong. <laughs> and $20 million later, the party's over, and we don't even have any idea how many of these things are still spinning. So let's go through our little algorithm. Need, of course, everybody needs water. Does it work? We don't really know. We know that a lot of them broke down. There were all kinds of schemes to keep them, um, keep them going. But what we do know that, that didn't, didn't really work. But what we do know is that the aquifers are different. And it doesn't work the same everywhere. And there are actually settings where kids would have to push this more than 24 hours a day to keep that full. And the last thing and the biggest thing was really, would they use it right? We all remember being on a merry-go-round when we were kids. We would use it every, it would be hot for a while. And then the swings are in. Or then some game, then jacks were in, and the merry-go-round would sit empty for a long time. And what it turned out was happening was that every time the foreigners with their cameras around, every, all the kids would rush over and start spinning this thing like crazy. As soon as they went, who was back turning it? It was the women. And we've got depressing footage of women trudging in a circle, and even, we heard that they were taking this, the thing apart completely and putting reliable pump handles back on the thing. This was a bad idea. So I get to be Mr. Downer. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you, this is actually a very hopeful time. <clears throat> I could spend the rest of the day telling you about great ideas with astonishingly competent people who are carrying them out. This. We know what works. We know what doesn't work. You now know the difference. If we can get <clears throat> the people who really know how to create change, the resources they know to do it, we're going to come out OK. Thank you.